and welcome to the Doofcast, the official variety podcast of doofmedia.com. My name is Scott Daly, and my usual stuntman, Matt Freeman, is out of town this weekend. Fortunately, the studio has supplied me with another stuntman to help me carry the load. Welcome back to the show, Adrian Torres. Adrian, it's been a little bit of a little bit of time since you've been on here. Yeah, I, you know, Scott, I, I really want to thank you for having me on. I am so glad to finally be t- talking about heart beeps with you. <laughs> Wait, is that no? Is this no? Th- this is not. We're not. We're not breaking back Phantom Zone. No. Why I, do I? I why do I? Told you. Why do I randomly get messages from people asking if the show's ever coming back? I, is that true? Yeah, occasionally I'll get I'll get messages. Wow. We, you can go on uh, occasionally just out of boredom when I do get one of these messages. I'll pop on to the official Doof Media channel, which you should, should subscribe to on YouTube. Well done. Well done. I know. I'm trying. <laughs> trying to help. But get in the good graces. Um, <laughs> occasionally I'll like somebody will ask me, Oh, what's a terrible movie? And I'm like, Oh, you should look at this. And I'll like try to find one to choose. And then I'm like, wait, what, why is this one? Like 400 people more than, (laughs) than it was. Why are people searching for this episode? That's now like four or five years ago. Why are there so many people looking for certain specific episodes? I don't know. That's a weird thing about putting podcasts on YouTube is just random stuff. We did an episode on Jackie Chan's first strike where we just Mm. talked about that movie for a couple hours. And for some reason, like, I guess when you like search Jackie Chan in the YouTube bar, that's one of the first things that comes up. And so we have a more than usual amount of downloads for it. (laughs) And like half the comments are like, what is this video? Because they just don't know that it's not. It's a podcast. <laughs> it just like, it's really funny. I don't know how that happens. I, I, I do find it. In, but it's not just you guys. It's like it's a big thing for people to put podcasts on YouTube. And oh, yeah. I still don't fully, fully understand because on most um, or at least most devices that, that I've used, like most phones, if you're on YouTube and like if you're trying to find audio or something like that and you turn off the screen, of course, it stops doing. Yep playing it so there's i'm guessing that most people are doing it on the desktop because i'm really worried about the person who has their phone out like at a job and just (laughs) has it onto that static image well for like an hour and 20 minutes i think youtube red their subscription service allows you to do that without the screen on so that would be my Uh, guess it's it's actually youtube music i'm sorry i'm sorry yeah yeah Um, youtube music is, is slightly different because i tried it for Uh, like their month trial they had and I was really confused because some of it's actual music that's from like basically siphoning off of uh, uh, Google Play music but then some of it's just the audio (laughs) of of videos so anyway um we have a podcast to do (laughs) and this week on the show we are reviewing the ninth film in Quentin Tarantino's filmography filmography once upon a time in Hollywood did I did I sell now, the, the the dot 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 there? Yeah, the dot 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 really worked. That uh, was on I think the like original poster, not on the first trailer, not in any of the press releases that came out until after the second trailer came out. Interesting. So there was a there was a discussion amongst people who were writing on the internet if you had the ellipsis in there or not. <laughs> and part of the reason why I'm kind of drawing things out in this normal conversational style is I, I felt like that would be representative of the movie somewhat. Yeah. Um I think it I think it is. Uh so we are going to try to do uh and I say try because I think this is a particularly difficult movie to talk about without any spoilers, <laughs> but we are going to try to do a no spoilers discussion of the movie. And then uh, after a clearly demarcated time, we'll move into some spoilers discussion. Uh, but again, this is it's a it's a complicated movie um, and it's difficult to really talk about how you feel about it without spoiling it. So we're going to try. It might be a pretty sh- short no spoiler section but i figure we'll yeah. give we'll give an overall review for the people who are just wondering should i go see this well well i think i think it's very easy to talk about large portions of the movie without being spoiler you know centric and so we can take our time through that and then we'll we'll fast forward a bit you know for for a truncated kind of spoiler section i i, I see exactly what you're doing and i can't really comment on it without spoiling the movie <laughs> 
We'll, we'll get to that eventually. Then. All right. All right. Um, yeah. So we're going to talk about Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and then we are going to mm-hmm. close the show by uh, just talking about the first wave of Fantastic Fest was announced this week. Um, it, 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 like it's perfect, like kismet that I had Adrian on the show this week um, because he's one of the people I go to Fantastic Fest with. So we're going to talk about some of that news and some of those movies that are playing and how uh, excited we are. It's the only film festival we cover here on the Doofcast uh, because it's the only film festival only I go to. Go to. <laughs> Good, good job representing your hometown there, Scott. <laughs> All right, guys, let's go ahead and move right into Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I'm Rick Dalton. It's my pleasure, Mr. Schwartz. Call me Miles. Put it there. That's your son? No, it's my stunt double, Cliff Booth. Last night, we watched a Rick Dalton double feature. <laughs> All the shooting. <laughs> I love that stuff, you know, with the killing. A lot of killing. Anybody order fried sauerkraut? (laughs) Come, you Nazi bastards! (laughs) Adrian, why don't you start start us off by telling me your overall thoughts on this movie? What did you think about Quentin Tarantino's ninth film? I, I really liked it, and I think what I liked about it is it harkens back to... Uh, it, it sounds weird to say like early Quentin Tarantino because it would be like kind of early mid at this point, mm-hmm. but it's it's more representative of the work that he's doing in Jackie Brown as opposed to say like Inglorious Bastards or Django Unchained or The Hateful Eight, mm-hmm. um, and that's because for a long period of time Jackie Brown was the outlier compared to everything else because every, all the other movies are kind of a hodgepodge of you know, movies that, that he loves, that he's showing reverence or homages towards and kind of a, a greatest, you know, clip series of those moments put into a larger story that he's created. Whereas Jackie Brown, of course, is based off of the work of Elmore Leonard. And so he's kind of reined in because he's working in this other person's sandbox and it was a writer that he really liked. And so he kind of had to push back on lots of the flourishes that he would normally do. And you have lots of that within Once Upon a Time, dot, 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 in Hollywood. <laughs> Yeah, I'd agree with that. I agree with that for sure. It is it is certainly a different movie than than his most latest films. I mean, I, it, mm-hmm. it feels crazy to say that Hateful Eight was f- four years ago, but I guess it was. Um, I, I didn't think it was 2015, but man, time is going by real fast. But that movie, I mean, for lack of a better word, was very hateful. It was very angry. That was an angry movie. Uh-huh. Um, it, it was it was a movie with a lot of angry characters. It was about anger. It, it to me, was a movie about um, Quentin dealing with modern times and modern America and like the, the anger that has infested a lot of the world. And geez, 2015, that was before the election. So God. Mm. Um, and, and yeah, in this movie, like this is not an angry movie. This is this is like a, it's it, well, well, OK, I mean, we'll, we'll we'll get to that. Yeah. But it, it definitely. Yeah, but this is a very I mean, this is a very nostalgic, heavy movie. He's looking back at this time, um, 1969, uh, at this this wonderful time at like right at the end of this, a certain era of Hollywood. And he's looking at it lovingly and he's looking at it um, with fondness. And, and he these characters like are expressions of the time and therefore he loves yeah. each and every one of these characters so much. And, and there's a lot of, it, it's very, I mean, it's, they're all twin Tarantino's movies are always funny, but it's, it's, it's kind in a way that I didn't expect. Mm-hmm. Um, do, do you want to, do you want a weird comparison? I, I haven't done any searching online, so maybe there is a chance that, that this has come up before, but I'm not sure. But in in a weird way, you can easily chart a line that, of course, this is a lot longer and not necessarily the same plot. But this kind of is his um, Wrath of Khan in a way. Oh, huh. Interesting. And, and because because of, because of, while everybody thinks about, you know, the the con aspect of it, the, there's a large port of um, Wrath of Khan that's dealing with uh kind of society uh time um positions moving people you know by 
and, and so like the actors and stuff like that as they're getting older and they're kind of moving out of a certain phase society and the hollywood system is saying that you're kind of needing to go on this course that's been yeah. pre you know determined for you and and uh, Wrath of Khan is all about that. You know, it's all about, you know, here's everybody from the, the Enterprise crew and they're getting older. You know, uh, Kirk, they have the big glasses joke that he's getting that he needs them to read. They're trying to put him into the to the admiral position instead of being with the the young bucks and everything. And and that's a big part of uh, of this film. But yeah. it's also kind of Tarantino, you know, kind of seeing himself in, in that lens that he's always made the point that after his 10th movie, he was going to stop. Yeah. And he takes all these times in between films and that you have people who are looking back and being like, oh, Reservoir Dogs, look how old that, that <laughs> movie is now as people are doing the anniversary. And he's kind of at the point where he's like, wow, it's really it's really been that long i'm always trying to be you know the 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 cool younger person who's kind of recapturing the, those films of my youth and everything but now i'm kind of being looked at as you know the old person and there's this whole new generation who's like oh i grew up watching you yeah. in this way and and like this film's kind of that that reflective stage for him yeah i mean i, I think that's a great point and i think that you know one of the things that a lot of I, the conversation around this movie is about specifically 1969 about uh, about this 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 form of Hollywood that died when Sharon Tate Ch Sharon Tate died and and I think that's absolutely what the movie is about but I completely agree with you that this is also very much a movie about Quentin Tarantino in the in the the end of his career it's a guy looking back at his entire career and looking back at the way things have changed and and I think there's absolutely some simpatico between him and and rick dalton as mm -hmm. a guy who you know the world has maybe moved past and feels like he just like doesn't doesn't belong in what what the new hollywood of 2019 is anymore um and yeah. him kind of both wrestling with that and and coming to terms with it but also also in a way kind of rejecting it too in a way mm -hmm. like i think one of the things this movie does and we'll talk about that in spoilers a little bit is is create a, a, a fantasy in which the bad the good times don't have to stop stop in which they just yeah. keep rolling in which nothing ever changes it's kind of a very conservative movie in that regard where it's like nothing has to change nothing has to move forward we can stay in this forever i want to stay in this um and i i i think it's it's really fascinating how the movie both is that as well as i think in my opinion a movie that also kind of accepts that that is fantasy that that is yeah. unbelievable that that is impossible um and i and i, I really appreciate that in it well the, i mean the funny thing is is when you're looking at it through that that prism uh, of the real world that we're now you know 50 years after th these events basically and the interesting thing that happens in the real world with that you know aging out and stuff like that is most lots of film directors unless you're somebody who's at the tippy top like, you know, a Scorsese or uh, a Ridley Scott or even, you know, somebody like Tarantino, that you have so many directors who hit for a period of time. And then as they're falling off on the wayside, they kind of do a, a comparative thing uh, as Rick Dalton, where they end up having to film TV shows. And you can yeah. look at lots of people's filmographies that you're like, oh, man, yeah, this guy made so many great action movies that I love in the 80s and 90s. And and, and oh, what's he done the last several years? And, and you look and you're like, oh, wait, this director who I've really respected for a period of time is directing new episodes of Hawaii Five-0. <laughs> yeah. I, and I'm not I'm not joking about that. And I yes, it's a little bit off course, but I know it's something that uh, that Tarantino likes. And it's the interesting comments of it because there's so many times when people are talking about Quentin Tarantino that they're saying that his work is too dense or too broad and there isn't really any of it that can hook on to like the the real world and so the fact that you're looking at these comment that he's making about you know actors but it's still the same as directors and he's somebody who's worried about it is the joke that I just made I'm talking about Joe Dante Wait, Joe Dante is directing episodes of Hawaii Five-0. Joe Dante direct has directed to date ten episodes of the Hawaii Five-0 remake. <laughs> I mean, but, I'm but glad he's getting work. It, it, I guess. Yeah, but 
but it's it's part of the way that the Hollywood system still today, 50 years later, still kind of views it that unless you're somebody who is at the very height of the game and is rolling with the punches with the way the studio wants it to, there's going to be a point where they kind of pigeonhole you in a way. And it's like, well, you're at this age. This is where the metrics that we view your careers sure. at. This is all that you, that you can do. And and that's why you, you have a, a great scene with Al Pacino where he's basically, you know, telling him, Hey, unfortunately, if you stay the way you are, you're basically going to become a yeah, laughing yeah. stock. But there's a chance that if you go outside the system and like nowadays, that's why you see all these directors who used to be big in the spotlight. Kind of taking on the, oh, I'm going to make a smaller indie movie. And if it comes out on VOD, that's OK, because at least I'm getting to make this movie that I care about instead of being shuffled off in the way that they told, tell me I have to go. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think that's true. And and the, one of the things I love I think this isn't a spoiler. We'll move into spoiler soon. But I mean, first of all, just generally, Brad Pitt and Leonardo DiCaprio are um, remarkable in this movie. Like, I I think this is some of the best work Leonardo DiCaprio has ever done. Like, full stop. Like, he is he is incredible. We've discussed this before that I'm not the biggest Leonardo DiCaprio. But when he when he wants to give something his all. And it's kind of in a weird way, like Anne Hathaway, that when they're not striving to do everything to get the gold, they can turn in really great performances. I hated the movie The Hustle earlier this year, but I (laughs) but I thought Anne Hathaway was great because she was going for it in a fun way. And it's the same with Leonardo DiCaprio here. He knows that this role is not necessarily going to get him gold or anything. It should. But he's but he's going for it and he's going for it in a way that lots of actors don't because it's not it's not showy in the way that gets you attention. It's just really well done and honed. And then Brad Pitt, you're just looking at Brad Pitt and you're like, yeah, sure. How are you, how are you 58 years old is what I want to say to Brad Pitt. He looks great. He looks fantastic. But if you, if you if you said that he'd have like one hand just slightly on his, (laughs) on his hip, tilt his head to the side and just go, no, stop. Yeah. I mean, let's, let's, I mean, funny Brad Pitt is best Brad Pitt, right? Like that that is when he's his best. And uh, he's so good here. And one of the things I like is that with both Brad and Leo, the camera is not like trying to hide their wrinkles at all. No. Their, their, their wrinkles are very front and center. Their skin looks aged. I mean, don't get me wrong. Both these men look fantastic. They, yeah. I, I will never look this good at their age ever. I don't look this that good now. But I mean, it really it's, it's not trying to hide any of this. They, they look old. They look like they're too old for this stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that's that's kind of the tragedy of it, um, especially in a character like Cliff Booth, Brad Pitt's character, who <coughs> never really got to do like at least Rick Dalton had a somewhat of a career. Cliff Booth like was kind of a stuntman for him for a while, but he never he, he never really got anything. And he's the movie says kind of totally screwed at the beginning. Yeah, he's just done. But but at the same time, he's kind of he's accepted it and like that's the interesting thing about the movie is the movie's about a whole bunch of people wanting to find their place and wanting to find acceptance Mm -hmm. and cliff for the most part is the only person in the movie who's kind of okay with his place that's true he yeah he'd love to be you know you know in a higher spot but he he's got this guy who's his his friend who he knows was going to try to go for you know at bat for him even when he's like no you don't have to do it it's it's okay I'm fine doing this you know he's eked out his life that he's okay with and he's mm-hmm. not he's not bending over backwards for anything he's just going to enjoy the life that he has and you get it in one of his um, one of the first early scenes you you know when he gets into his car. And he still, you know, has that stuntman me- mentality and he's just driving as fast as he can back yeah. and forth because he's just taking the moment to enjoy it. Whereas at the same time, Rick is just, you know, a ball of tension this whole time. And, and yeah. Cliff's the person in the movie outside of some hippies that we'll get to who's, who's really OK with his place. He sure. might he yeah. might have some regrets, but for the most part, he's OK with his place. Yeah, I think I think that's accurate. And and yeah, I mean, speaking of tension, I think that's one thing that does separate this movie from a lot of Tarantino's later works. So a, a lot of the past few movies he's made have he's made have been very specific 
tension films, right? Like yeah. films that create a tense scene and just hold on to that tension as long as they can. And this movie is a lot more chill. And I'm not mm-hmm. saying there's not tense scenes in this movie. There absolutely are. But I think the way Tarantino plays off that tension where like you you kind of expect things to boil over and it doesn't happen quite in the way you would think mm-hmm. um, is really kind of something that sets this movie apart from from the other late Tarantino ones. Well, and it, like I said, the, the, he tries to strive for the characters to be more real. And that's part of what it going back to the Jackie Brown that, you know, the characters are relatively more more grounded, like the character that Robert Forrester plays in Jackie Brown isn't the type of character that you're going to have the majority of um Quentin Tarantino films because sure. they're they're not over the top. They're not larger than than life. You know, they're they're existing within the frame, but they're not demanding that the screen be turned their way. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. You're right. Um, all right. Do we want to I have so much more I want to say, but. I, I also want to move into spoilers. No, I, I think I think spoilers is and I'll, I'll say this to to take the heat so that you don't have to. They, you okay. know, anyone on the Internet can blame me. Um, part of the reason why we've been kind of dancing around stuff is because for lots of the movie, it it, it feels vaguely aimless. Yes. And and that's not the the worst thing in the world because like what's what's going on on screen is absolutely captivating you're just not sure exactly like what direction he's taking it in so the generalities that we're talking in is very much the way that he's kind of dealing with that until about two thirds of the way through the film when and stop here if you don't want any spoilers yeah spo- spoilers starting right now everyone spoilers spoilers okay go ahead where he fast forwards in a section of the of the movie to get to the to the heart of the matter and to get to yeah. the action, as it were, to get to the grand Guggenhall of it all. Yeah. Uh, w- one thing we have not said a word about throughout this entire review so far is Sharon Tate is uh, Charlie Manson. Um, we haven't mentioned that at all. And that is the that is the moment of this film. And mm-hmm. w- I, I, I absolutely I love what they've done because. So you're absolutely right. The two thirds of the movie is a, is a, it's a complete hangout film. You have Rick Dalton, you have Cliff Booth and you have Sharon Tate kind of just like going through two days living yeah. in 1969 Hollywood, um, which, which, which first of all, I, I want to give a great shout out. One of the wonderful things that Quentin Tarantino does in his alternate reality is that he makes sure to give you um the little title names for certain people, you know, who who lived in the real world that you might know the names of, you know, of course, J.C. Bring, you know, everybody who was involved eventually in uh, the, the Tate uh, murders that right. that occur through the Manson family. But he he makes sure to give you Steve McQueen, but he doesn't give you. And I thought this was so weird that I, it's a weird question that no one would ask. But I'd love to ask is Sharon Tate shows up early in the film at the Playboy Mansion. Yep. And they show all these other famous people and they have little title card names so you know who they're supposed to be. And then a woman emerges from the crowd to grab Sharon Tate and go dance. And it's Mama Cass. Oh, I didn't know that. But they didn't because it's clearly Mama Cass. That's who they're doing because Mama Mama was friends with, with this whole group of people. And, yeah. you know, th- they have – uh, the mamas and the papas on the soundtrack for the movie. So it's 100 percent mama cast. But yeah. he never puts the little indicator in there. And it's crazy that you have this little crystallized moment in 1969 of these two women, one who who is very, you know, high in demand and popular. And you have one that's rising the charts and both of which whose lives are just absolutely torn apart at such a young age that he has them colliding in that moment, dancing to the music at, at the play, the playboy mansion where they're, they're happy together in their friendship unbeknownst to them yeah. that, that, that they're going to be cemented in history, not for the things that they've done, but those they don't get to do. Yeah. And, and I think speaking of, of Sharon Tate, I mean, I think that's, that's a lot of what this movie has on its mind. I mean, it, it's doing some very specific things in the ending, but Sharon Tate's role in the early film is, is to kind of honor her in a way that is entirely separate from the thing she's most known for, which is being killed. Um, and, and, yeah. and I love those scenes in the movie. Like I, I my, 
favorite. I mean, one of my favorite parts of the movie is Margot Robbie sitting in the theater watching her her film and and what i love the detail that tarantino has done here like we have different scenes throughout the movie um we have the great escape but leonardo dicaprio is 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 put in um for steve mcqueen in the role uh which is just hilarious but when they're watching the what is the name of that i've totally forgot the name of the film the, the, wrecking, the, the crew. wrecking crew thank you when they're yep. watching the wrecking crew that's sharon tate like Yep. Quentin Tarantino has shown that he's willing to put in the actors that are playing the characters into the movies, but he doesn't do that there. So what we're looking at is we're looking at, at Margot Robbie sitting in a theater like like enraptured by the performance of Sharon Tate on the screen. And I think that's so powerful. It's so powerful. It's like, look at her. This is she was she was a gifted actress. She was everyone liked her she could could have had this amazing career um and we want to mm-hmm. honor this version of her not the part that we're going to get to at the end of the movie and i don't know there's just something about that image like see, like and i know like everyone jokes about quentin tarantino's foot fetish right and, and there's a lot of feet in this movie there's a whole lot of feet in this movie but margot robbie's feet up there and they're like dirty they're not clean because it's a theater and it's gross but it's just this whole like chill like this love vibe where it's just like, he's just, he's just wanting to live in this world for a couple, a couple days. And yeah, and that's what he does. That's, and it, it, you're absolutely right. It feels aimless. It's, it's kind of supposed to feel aimless. I think it's been called a hangout movie. Um, but he just, he just wants to, he just wants to recreate this and live in it for a while before, before he rewrites history. And I mean, that that, I think that's what's so interesting about it is for years, they're the movies that Quentin Tarantino was was trying to recreate that he loved. And here he is getting to recreate that world and in recreating that world and that time, he hints to something better uh, as a filmmaker. Like if, if he was just doing period pieces like this, as opposed to feeling that he had to. Uh, I'm trying to think of the best way to put it. Uh, let's say Kevin Smith things, if you will. <laughs> and OK. And, and, and that and that's because there's a certain point in Kevin Smith's career where he basically started saying that he was doing everything for fans. It, it was still very much for him, but he was doing it under the guise of I'm giving this to the fans. I'm giving them the part of me that they want. Yeah. Even if it wasn't something that they actually wanted and Quentin Tarantino, the way that he's directed things over the years, people could easily say that he was getting to the point where he was doing things just because it's either what his audience wanted or expected of him. Whereas this movie is the opposite of that. Well, oh, it's, he, it's the most personal movie I think he's ever made. Like Exactly. But, but it's also at times it's reserved. It's restrained. It's it's better. And I know there's lots of people who are like the movie's too long. He you know, the fact that he doesn't have his editor anymore, but it it kind of works for what he's wanting to do with this. And if this is the direction that he would want, like if he decided, you know, to pull uh, Steven Soderbergh and P.T. Anderson and be like, guess what? I'm not I'm not really retiring for a bit. I've got some more in me. And if he were to make them like as personal and focused as this movie, I don't think anybody would really complain. No, no. I mean, some people would because people always do. But uh, I, of course. I, I, I agree with you on that one. And I mean, I think you're absolutely right that like Inglorious Bastards, I love that movie, but that is yeah. that is a movie that's like it's a gift to people. It's like, let's let's all take out our, our collective catharsis and just fucking mm. shoot Hitler in the face. Um, this this movie is is so personal. This is he's doing this for himself. He made this movie for himself. He the ending of this movie occurs for himself um, and yeah. and nobody else. And, and and that's one of the things like as we get into talking about the ending, which I want to do. Go one of it. the things that I've heard a lot of people say, and, and my wife echoed this, um, is that this movie assumes, you know, a whole lot about the Manson family and about Sharon Tate's murders. Um, it doesn't really go into any of this in any kind of detail it doesn't really explain any of this mm. and i had i i knew a lot about Tr- charlie manson i knew a lot about the manson family i knew a lot about the tate murders um just because it's it's, it's things i was curious I, about but also because i listened to a uh um uh you wow well, what's the podcast 
um, you must remember this, the, okay. the Karina Longworth podcast. Yeah. She did a whole season on, on um, Charles Manson. Mm-hmm. He, he's, he's about to, to play a big part in the next season of Mindhunter. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and so my wife was like, man, if you hadn't told me about like, cause I told her like Charlie Manson sends his family, kills Sharon Tate and, and a bunch of other people. Um, I basically set the stage for her going in. Yeah. She asked me and she's like, if you hadn't told me that I wouldn't have known what was going on. And a lot of people are using that as a, a, a reason for why the movie doesn't work. And I kind of disagree on that. Like, I think yeah, it's OK I, for a movie to assume or or for, to require you to do some homework on yeah. the outside a little bit. Well, here here's three, three simple questions. You don't have to answer all of them. You can answer whichever one you want. But it's something that the people who are listening to the podcast, I want to take a moment to to think about what their answer would be. You might completely disagree with me. That's fine. Okay. I, I'm more okay if there are situations in which people disagree with me to have a conversation as opposed to yell at the other person for being wrong. I'm of the belief that that if I like a movie and you dislike a movie, I want to to discuss the points of where, you know, what what we both might like or what you dislike so that I have a better understanding of not only your viewpoints, but then what you appreciate in movies, because I think yes. it, it it makes for better friendships. It makes for, you know, better times when you're just talking about movies with people, as opposed to saying, no, guess what? Screw you. Your opinion's different than me. <laughs> I, yeah, th- that's terrible. I think we, we can we, agree we, on that. Yeah, for sure. We live in a point where too many people are willing to do that or say, no, you're not kowtowing to me. So the first question, and I'm going to mention all three and then you can decide which one you want to do. Uh, the first one is, what do filmmakers owe the audience as for explaining historical, you know, you know, pieces? Yeah. Um, and that, that that's one of them, because, I mean, it's a big thing about this is because that's what lots of people are basically saying is that, like, if you have something that takes place in a certain moment of history that might be thought of, you know, being in uh, pop culture at one time or, or another, how much is it dependent upon you to explain that to the audience Two is, and I don't mean this to, it, it might sound condescending. It's not, it's a genuine question that I actually have because I'm a couple of years away from my 20, 20 year high school graduation, uh, for, for the reunion. Yep. I, I don't know what's taught in schools today. So when I ask what are you teaching in American history these days, I'm genuinely curious because (laughs) because the Manson family was something that they were going over when they were going over, you know, the history of the 60s. You know, you've got both Kennedys, you know, you've you've got the Cold War, you've got Manson, that they're things that they were teaching in class and they were explaining. You also have various different documentaries that have come out over the years um, that, that have been focusing on different stuff and throughout, you know, the decades, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. They had a TV show. You've got lots of uh, of that So we live in an age where they literally have information everywhere. You've got Wikipedia. You've got so many things at the disposal. At what point is it on the filmmakers if certain people don't know? You're not going to be able to please anybody. That's totally understandable. But where, what, what line do we have? Do you make sure to mention a footnote? Do you have to spend a little bit of time with certain characters that are setting it up so that if you're not sure, you discuss it with people after? Because there was a point in time when you were going to see the movies and, you know, the 90s and early aughts before the Internet was what it is now. If you saw something in a movie that was at a point in history and you weren't sure, you would ask somebody and somebody might overhear you and be like, oh, this is actually what they were talking about. It's it's not really a hugely known thing. This is what it is. And you're like, oh, no, well, well, thank you. We we had a conversation as opposed to being like, you know, I didn't know about this. So therefore, this thing is bad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so my answer to your first question is nothing. <laughs> the, the 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 filmmaker does not owe the audience anything. And and I think. I I think like I also think it depends because 
Uh-huh. I think it depends on what you're trying to do with your movie and what the goal of your movie is. And I don't think the goal of this movie was to teach people a history lesson about Sharon Tate and Charles Manson. Like, I don't think that's what the goal of the movie was. So I, the fact that the movie doesn't take the time to do that, I'm fine. This is not this is not a Charlie Manson biopic. This is not a Sharon no. Tate biopic. It, it is not that is not what it wanted to do. So I. I, no, absolutely not. This movie does not need to teach people that. Um, if you didn't enjoy the movie because you had no idea who Sharon Tate was and had no idea who Charlie Manson is, I, that sucks. I'm sorry. Maybe like mm-hmm. Google it and then like, <laughs> go 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 watch the terrible Haley Duff film oh God, right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, or read read Helter Skelter because that's supposed to be. I haven't read it, but it's supposed to be amazing. Um, but okay, the, here's here's the weird thing that that I felt we should uh we, we should bring up. How many people know the Beatles? Everybody. How, how many people know Helter Skelter? I, I don't know me. <laughs> no, but but I'm saying that there's some point in time that what did did people just has anyone listen to the song who's new to the song and didn't happen to put it into Wikipedia or, you know, put it in Google and get Manson family helter skelter stuff Yeah, yeah. I, I, instead of getting the Beatles right away. I mean, that's it, when they were putting this film together, whether it be in the plot synopsis, you know, or whatever, Sharon Tate's name has been connected to this for, for a period of time. Yeah. If you look up the plot summary, basically anywhere it has the name Sharon Tate you can easily do a little, you know, precursor to that. If you don't, that's fine. You don't have to. You shouldn't have to walk into every movie doing that. Yeah. But at the, at the same time, as important as that is to it, what Quentin Tarantino does in the film is – is different. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so, so the, the direction where he goes, it does, it doesn't fully matter if you know who she is. Yes. It might explain, you know, the level of the violence and the demons that he's working out, but also at the same time, he doesn't continually refer to, you know, them as the Manson family more than anything else. They're referred to as hippies. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Charlie Manson is barely in this movie. Uh, He's got two yeah, scenes. Does I he think. have a line? I don't know if he talks like ever. Yeah, yeah, he does. He does when he goes up to the house and he's talking to to yeah. Jay when he comes to the front door. He asks if he can help him, and he mentions uh, the people who used to live yeah. in the house. You're right. And 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 that's when Jay mentions him. He's like, "Oh, they haven't lived here in sure. a while." Yeah. And that's when when Charlie gets a glimpse of uh, of yeah, Sharon Tate. Is, uh, that maybe because I again I think I think the movie does. I will admit that the movie works a whole lot better if you know the history. Absolutely. But, but should, should the filmmaker, should the filmmaker be required to teach you the history? I I think no. So, okay. Well, here, here's a very, and this is on an infinitesimally smaller level and maybe it'll help some people who, who are out there in general because they might kind of think of it as a joke, but uh, I'm going to butcher his name. So I, I sincerely, Apologize to you, Master Director. Uh, Sergio Corbucci is, is is a name that Al Pacino mentions. You know, to Rick Dalton, it's like, hey, he wants he's got a movie that he's putting together. Well, he's using. There's so many fake names that are throughout the movie, and he does list some other you know fake directors. But Sergio Corbucci was basically when they're referencing and saying that he's the second biggest spaghetti western director it was true the the number one one was of course was sergio leone who uh, quentin mm-hmm. tarantino is yeah. obsessed with but corbucci was yeah. was the next one who was on there who was working on so many different things and so if you don't know the name it doesn't really mean anything to you but it makes the joke work even more and then the fact that you know one of the movies um uh, is called i believe it's called kill uh, kill ringo said the gringo that that's a whole nother play on the spaghetti Western movies that uh, Ringo, you know, was in line with uh, a whole bunch of other characters who had an actual spaghetti Western movie. But then so many spaghetti Western movies were being made uh, throughout the year that they would slap an American title onto like whatever the closest name was. So like earlier in the movie, San Wanamaker, the director, says that he wants to have a big Zabata like mustache on Rick Dalton's character. And Zabata was another, you know, character that was in all these uh, spaghetti Western yeah. movies. So, so it, it, there's little pieces of that throughout that you could easily say, but, but no one's comparing that because they're finding out about the murders and how big it is. But in a way it's like, well, there's 
all these threads that Tarantino's putting in there for 1969 that you might realize are actual things that you might not know about as well. But it's this one sure. element that because of the rage and anger he's working through towards them, that that's what I think is setting people off. And I think there is I think there is a prism that if you don't know about it, that burst of violence um, might seem weird. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about that directly. Yeah. Um, so the, the end of the movie, um, we, we move, we like fast forward six months in time to the day of Sharon Tate's death. Um, we kind of live through the day for all our characters. Mm-hmm. And one of the, the really structurally fascinating things the movie does to me, at least, is that suddenly we have uh, a Kurt Russell voiceover like that, that appeared at one point yeah. early in the movie and then went away for almost all of it is suddenly back to guide us through the rest of this movie. And it really, it really helps, I think, like distinguish the last third of the movie from Mm -hmm. the preceding two thirds. It's almost a completely different story. Now we've moved away from this chill hangout movie where we're like speaking romantically and nostalgically about 1969. And now we're in, okay, but here's, here's the true, the true fairy tale moment. Exactly. Um, And, and so, so the Mansons are there to kill. Or the, sorry, not the Mansons. The Manson family mm-hmm. is there to kill Sharon Tate and everyone that lives in that house. Um, but they run into our our fake characters before that happens. Yeah, a, a, a wonderful, wonderful Rick Dalton drinking a giant frozen <laughs> margarita straight from the blender itself. Oh, and that's that's what I mean by Leonardo DiCaprio is so good because like he plays the scene earlier in the movie with so much pathos where he's like yeah. this this washed up actor like he puts a little stutter into his voice that I just love it's like such such an insecure stutter in his voice earlier in the movie and then six months later he's playing this over the top character who's like this drunk buffoon and I I just it's just so good. Anyway, I, so, yeah, I, I he, wanted to 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 it's going to be the quickest thing, but uh, uh, the stutter matters uh, a lot to me. And that's because I when lots of people think of stutters in movies, it's usually like a, a really big tick uh, yeah. to, to the point of, let's say, Rain Man, like that type of like an almost autistic tip when it comes to. Sure to stuttering and what most people don't know about stuttering is it's not an always always thing for every single person there's lots of people who have a stutter that it only comes out when they're getting like really flustered or when they're getting really angry and frustrated that it's in the moment when your brain's trying to search for those words that your your motor functions kind of get you know, literally stutter up on themselves. Right. right and right. so there's plenty of scenes where he doesn't have uh, the, the stutter come out the whole time. But when he's getting really frustrated with himself, you know, he's commenting on the stutter when he's really nervous, when he's meeting Al Pacino at the beginning, you know, he's got the slight stutter and it, it comes out at certain points. It's not an always thing. It's not like back in the day where every single line would have a stutter. And so as as somebody who does have a stutter themselves, it, it was nice to see the way that he was presenting it. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. Great. I'm glad you said that. That is a good point. Yeah. Um, so he chases the Manson family away. <laughs> and so they decide instead of killing Sharon Tate and everyone in her house, they're going to kill <laughs> these guys now. The, so. the, the idols who who shaped their youth through television, but are living a sham. <laughs> yeah, they talked to them about murder, so why not murder, murder them? Um, also, which is, who's which who's is like a very, who's sorry, who's ahead. in the who's in the car? I think it was one of the perfect um, kind of zeitgeist moments where this movie's coming out just as somebody's entering uh, the pop culture consciousness because you had Stranger Things happen. Uh, Stranger Things season three come out recently, and who is one of the the Manson family people? Uh, that would be Ethan Hawke's daughter. And whose daughter? Um, oh, shit. Uma Thurman. Is it? Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So so you might not have Uma Thurman in the most recent Quentin Tarantino film, but you do have her spawn directly in the movie who, <laughs> who, who gets a great moment. But because of the success that she's found for Stranger Things, people know who, who, who she is now. So it's fun getting to be like, oh, that's Uma Thurman's daughter. Yeah. 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 Um, and so they just, yeah, they decide to kill them. They bust into the house. Um, <laughs> and they find a, a Cliff Booth who's uh, just smoked an acid cigarette. Um, and 
he proceeds to kill them all. Um, both both of them, both Rick Dalton and Cliff Booth. Rick Dalton uh, kills the final one with the the greatest Chekhov's flamethrower <laughs> ever, um, and possibly only Chekhov's flamethrower. But so it's it's this act of like this is probably the least violent Quentin Tarantino movie in a long time. But this is this is the usual kind of Quentin Tarantino violence in this. Well, it's it's even more so. I think it's like it's I think it's it's as big as that one uh, final shot in in Glorious Bastards, but expounded upon. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, it is pretty brutal. I mean, what what Cliff Booth does to <laughs> I, I can't remember. I can't remember her name. Um, yeah. The one he smashes into the the mantle of the fireplace. He smashes this woman's face into the mantle of the fireplace multiple times. Basically, caves her entire head in. Mm-hmm. The movie shows all of that. Um, and, and and what we were kind of alluding to in the conversation before was a lot of people have come out and said, you know, Quentin Tarantino doesn't have a great track record with depiction of violence towards women and people were using this as just another example. And while I understand that, and I don't I don't want to say that that's not a legitimate feeling to have i think it certainly is Uh, that is a true thing about quentin tarantino um however i i think in this movie as you said before this is him working out his his anger Mm -hmm. at what these people did at at, i mean obviously he loved sharon tate like you could see by the way he filmed margot robbie in this movie and and everything we talked about previously and and these people did a horrible thing i mean let's not forget she was eight months pregnant they played with her blood afterwards. I mean, yeah. these people were horrifying. Monsters. She she asked them to spare her child and she was stabbed. I believe it was 16 times yeah. in yeah. in the stomach. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's 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 horrifying. It mm. is terrible. And that is it is Tarantino working out those demons and, and wanting to live into a world because I, I don't know if that's something we specifically said, but Sharon Tate's murder has become kind of the symbol for the end of an age of innocence in, mm-hmm. in LA, right. In Hollywood exactly. where like this, this was the Hollywood Hills and like the whole thing about nobody, nobody locked their doors mm-hmm. because nothing bad would ever happen here. Um, everything is good. And, and look, Hollywood was changing already. Like Hollywood would have changed whether or not Sharon Tate was murdered or not. Yeah. But it, it became like the, it became like the symbol of that change. That was the moment in which things started changing. Exactly. Because the, the seventies are the, are the revolutionary points yeah. in films that everybody looks at. But amid all that revolution that you have, you do have the full on rise out of the spaghetti Westerns that you have the exploitation and the sexploitation yeah. genre yeah. come out and you have lots of movies that are are preying upon that change in pace, like the Hills have eyes and, um, I spit on your grave and last house on the left that, that were, you know, taking these, these moments of, Oh, here's the nice suburban family, you know, who's, who's being preyed upon now. Yeah. 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 So, so I think Quentin, you know, sees that and he says, I don't want it to be that way. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I liked this time. And in my movie, in my fairy tale version of the story, that doesn't happen. In my fairy tale version of the story, I use my characters, my stand-ins, basically, <laughs> to brutally stop this murder and and kill these people and punish them for the things that they did. And and then, of course, the ending is that uh, that Leonardo DiCaprio's character Rick Dalton, on the verge of his career officially being over, yep. gets invited up to the Polanski house, um, is introduced to Sharon Tate. The, the implication here is that his career will see a resurgence. Um, he will he will go on getting to live. His glory days will not stop. His, yep. his his life will go on. Um, his relationship with Cliff Booth will be saved because that's the other thing is this. This was like their last night and they were going to go their separate ways after this moment. The implications there are that that's not going to happen either. Um, that just basically everyone gets to be happy. Everyone, everything gets to go on. Everyone gets what they want. And it's a fairy tale. And he's acknowledging yeah. that it's a fairy tale in the title. That's what I love about yeah. it. It's like he knows he, he's he's not yeah. saying like. I wish he is saying I wish it could be this way, but he's acknowledging that it it's just it can't and it yeah. won't. And yeah, because the the, the moment that he starts dry or walking up the the walkway is when 
the title hits the screen for the first time Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. here it is once upon a time in Hollywood, here is your fairy tale. Here's the life that, you know, didn't to be lived. And, and, and now here it is. Yeah. And it's kind of, I mean, it's kind of sad, right? I mean, like Mm -hmm. as funny as this movie is, as warm as, as this movie is, as angry at times as this movie is, I think the, the ending is melancholic. It is, it is him like having worked out those demons, having having had his heroes save the day. Yeah. It, him acknowledging that, OK, now we have to go back. Now we have to go back to the world in which this didn't happen. Now mm-hmm. you have to walk out of the theater and walk out into a world in which nobody saved Sharon Tate. She died. Everything changed. Um, and, and that that part of time died. And. Uh, yeah, I, it's it, it felt a little sad. Walk, I, I felt well, a little bad for Quentin Tarantino walking out of the theater. But but the funny thing is about the glory days is you're all you only look back fondly at, at the glory days with those rose colored glasses. Absolutely. Everything everything melts away and you just pick that point in time and you say, wasn't that time great? And it's yeah. I, I know it's kind of a weird thing to mention, but it, it's very much in the whole idea that when you. Uh, when you break up with somebody or you've been dumped, that there's a period of time that you're like, oh, well, what could I have done differently? You know, if I have the opportunity to date them again, would I, would I do it? And sure. you have people who try to get back together and when they do, it doesn't work. And that's because they're, they're trying to win back an idea of a person who doesn't exist anymore as opposed yeah. to the person, the way they are. Yeah. But and I, maybe never existed. Maybe, like, right. Like, th- like this version of Hollywood never actually existed. Exactly. Like, like we can pretend it was this perfect, wonderful time, but no, there yeah. was, there was huge amounts of racism. There mm-hmm. was huge amounts of sexism. I mean, there was exploitation of people. It yep. was cruel. It was terrible. Like, and, this, and it never existed. And all that bubbling up leads to so many different genres and films that you get in the 70s. Right. And if you if you have that more idyllic world, if you have, you know, certain terrible things not happen, you don't have people inspired, you know, to react to the things right, that, exactly. that are going yeah. on. If, if everything's perfect, you don't have that desire to speak out about it. And it's like that's the the kind of unfortunate thing that anytime anybody that you're in a bad period, you know, you, you see lots of people nowadays when bad things are going on mention, you know, that it's the darkest timeline and they they they're like, oh, remember these these good old days. And but at the same time, when you're in that darkness, you have so many people who, you know, who are making great pieces of music, who who are writing, you know, great novels about that struggle, who are wanting to make art to express themselves as a release yeah. from from what's going on around them. And if you don't have that darker side, it doesn't strive people to make those advances forward. Yeah, I think you're right. And, and, and I wonder, like, I think. Quentin Tarantino understands that more than anyone as a, oh, as yeah. a student oh, yeah. of film who knows more about movies than I will ever know ever. Um, mm-hmm. I think he understands that as well. And and I think 100% and, and which is why I don't think this movie is like saying that, gee, I wish we could still be living in that time. Um, no. It's just a love letter to it. It's just a love exactly. letter to this, this to this idea of this time. And now it's over. And now we go on and, and do more stuff. Yeah, and that's why it has that hangout picture vibe because yeah. he wants he wants to be able to have that time to to drink it in, you know, to appreciate all the different, you know, levels and everything. It's it's his own slice of heaven in a way. So, you know, why wouldn't he, you know, want to indulge in every thrill that he could possibly have, you know, and indulge in every little flourish that he can throw here and there. But at, at the same time, while while making a film that that's that passionate, it, it does have that until the very end, of course, that yeah. subdued level that that shows a, a, a different side of Quentin Tarantino, which is, I think, what I really like and respect about this movie is that the other ones, you know, he, he continually goes over the top. And while, you know, he does get to that point, there's so much there that that you can just sit and and live in and yeah. enjoy in the moment. Yeah, I, I totally agree totally agree and that's i mean that's why i think like uh, we made the demarcation point that it's almost two different movies because yep. that yeah that the, the first two thirds is a very different kind of tarantino and i like that tarantino a lot mm-hmm. and i hope we get to see him again i really do one thousand percent all right uh before we wrap up just a couple a 
couple more things. Um, we didn't talk about Margaret Qualley, who is just so amazing <laughs> in this movie. She, she's, she's having, I know it, it, I mean, well, I guess it's not weird with, with her part, but she's, she's having a ball. Yeah. That, oh that's God. the best way to put it. She and, um, uh, Julia Butters who plays Trudy. Yeah. The, the little girl actress, like you can just tell how much fun they're, they're having in these parts. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the other part I wanted to talk about is the little girl scene with, uh, with Rick. Cause I think that's one of the most important scenes of the movie. Um, yeah. and it's crazy to me that that little girl had no idea who Leonardo DiCaprio was <laughs> because that's so perfect for the scene, right? Like, exactly. This, it's like this, this wash up actor that, that, doesn't even know and you got this little girl who's like entirely dedicated to the part and he's just this washed up guy who's just doing this on the side it's a wonderful scene i love his story about the the book he's reading um i I think that's that's like that's the movie right there and and what i love about it is it's it's on the nose but it's on the nose in a way that works because of leo's performance and the the, yes when he breaks down and cries (laughs) in the middle of him telling the story of the cowboy who hurt himself and was never the same again like i i think uh Oh, I love that scene so much. Yeah. And then like you, you said pussycat. So we'll make sure to mention her name. Yes. Mar- Margaret Qualley's character. Like she's just, she, she's, she's giving a lot to a part that doesn't necessarily need it. Yeah. Most other, most other actresses, most other filmmakers aren't really going to focus yeah. so much on it. And it, it's so much about, body language and just being in the moment and that energy she's giving off to Brad Pitt that yeah. completely sells it. Yeah. And there's something just inherently unsettling in it too. And I think that's what she plays really well with it is because like when she's flirting with, with Brad Pitt, there's, there's this energy there, but there's yeah. always this unsettling thing behind it. And that's why, I mean, the spawn ranch, the entire spawn ranch scene is, yeah. is the one moment we were talking about before we got to spoilers that were, Tarantino goes back into his Hitchcocky intention and just like mm-hmm. stresses the shit out of you for like 10 minutes. Um, and the, the most fascinating part about that scene to me is that it, it never boils over. Like you're just waiting for no. it to boil over. And then it's just like, no, nothing happens. Nothing happens. And it, it, it's also history. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, 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 that it's literally history. Like if you're looking up anything about, you know, the Mansons that that takes a big, that that's a big slice of it right there is that they were, you know, that they were preying upon this uh, partially deaf, mostly blind <clears throat> old man right. and just kind of squatting on there that they were very much taking advantage yeah. of him. And I think uh, <clears throat> the the guy Clem that Cliff Booth beats the shit out of did murder uh-huh. a stuntman at Spawn Ranch like that happened in real life. So. Uh, I didn't know that going into the movie, but if I had known that going into the movie, I would have been even more stressed out about it because like, I was like, oh, God, this is a made up character. But maybe he's he's doing that. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, yep. And I, I guess that actually should have been a, a hint to us that he's going to rewrite history when he has Cliff Booth beat the shit out of the guy. Um, well, very much so. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. What else? What else do I want to do before um, I wanted to? I saw I, I forget uh, who was tweeting this. Um, I wanted to give them credit, but uh, someone compared this movie to the nice guys in a really interesting way. Um, well, I can see that. I can see that. Yeah, because the, the, the kind of the buddy, it's not buddy cop, but the relationship between Cliff and um, and Rick is very similar to the relationship mm-hmm. between the two characters and the nice guys. And uh, and then you got Margaret Qualley in there, too. So it's exactly the same. <laughs> One hundred percent. Nothing's different. Everything's the same. Um, I, I, I like that comparison a lot because I like both of these movies and there are moments where they have that same kind of energy where it's really just seeing these characters that end up caring deeply for each other, paying off each other in fun mm-hmm. ways. And, and it's also taking two well-known and established um, male actors and having them play kind of against their, their traditional type. Yeah. You're right. Um, and, and playing with the, with, um, what, what should be overly machismo characters and at different times making them rather goofy, um, which was, you know, kind of, a it was still on that tipping point yeah. at the time in, in the film world and, and everything. Did you see that article today that Statham, the rock and um, Vin Diesel, like, like have in their film contracts that they're not allowed to lose a fight. 
<laughs> that made me what you just said made me think of that because like a lot of these movies these characters get the shit kicked out of them right and and i think yeah. i think that is important i think it's important well, to see your action characters vulnerable like i think john wick is one of the best action movies in of the past decade and and he gets his shit kicked out of him. Well, no, no. I mean, it's, it's the, it's still a big point in, in the eighties. And they actually brought this up on, um, on the, the movies, the, the series that CNN has that I, I love that they're, that they're talking to all these filmmakers and everything. And then they cut to Jason Bailey and cut to Paul Shear, <laughs> but, but it makes me feel good. Or they, <laughs> they cut to Alfonso and they cut, cut to Drew McQueenie. And it's like, okay, this is, they're getting the big actors, they're getting the directors, and then they're getting, you know, uh, various different film critics that are in there. So it's fun to see. But there's a point when they're talking about the 80s where they're mentioning that Die Hard is the big tipping point because after the the sensitive 70s, as people call it, uh, when you get to the 80s, you have people like Arnold Schwarzenegger – and various big, you know, muscle bound action stars, you know, you got, um, for a period of time, you've got Dolph Lundgren, you've got JCVD who are popping up at different points, but you've got mm -hmm. Die Hard with, uh, Bruce Willis, whose character starts out, you know, with a clean <laughs> shirt and completely unharmed feet. And by the end of the movie, <laughs> he's, he's got, he's got all the cuts on his feet. He's got cuts all over his body, cuts on his face. The tank top is now black completely. Yeah. Um, but, but it's, it's that tipping point where you had, where the male action stars had to be the peak of machismo and get the ones that people started to latch onto were the ones who were able to save the day, but took a beating in the process where they were allowed to be human. And that John wick as super heroic as he is, is still allowed, you know, to to be shown being cut and shot and bleeding all over the place. Yeah. Hell yeah. Um, also, um, Mission Impossible, Tom Cruise gets his ass kicked in those movies. Oh, constantly. I mean, the whole beginning to number three is him strapped to a chair yeah. while bleeding on the face, pleading for somebody's life. Yes, 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 absolutely. It was, by the way, it was Priscilla Page who uh, made the nice guys connection. Um, oh, of course. Of course. Yeah. I'm not I'm not surprised yeah. if you guys um, if you guys like movies, if you like action movies and you don't follow Priscilla Page on Twitter or read her writing, uh, fix that immediately. She's one of the best writers out there and she's incredible. Yes. And, and Brit, too, of course. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. All right. Because um, that was my that was going to be my guess for a second. I was like, that's why I didn't say anything. I'm like, it's either going to be somebody that I'm that I'm not thinking of who always talks about action uh, movies or movies like that, <laughs> like like Outlaw Vern would say it. But then in the back of my mind, I'm like, but maybe it was Britt Hayes or maybe it was Priscilla. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. You, you never know. My my only interaction with Britt Hayes has ever been um, I followed her on Twitter for such a long time and then i was walking by her at fantastic fest and i did the thing like the the, rec oh, hey. the recognition <laughs> nod that you give someone when you like see someone that you recognize and go hey um forgetting that she doesn't know me at all and this is a person that i only know because i followed them good, and it was job, the most awkward job, experience of my life and i will never uh talk to her again <laughs> that's that's scott at fantastic fest everyone yeah that's me that's me Wait, which brings us to doodle, 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 doodle. Doof. Yeah, that's a perfect transition away from Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, which is a great movie that you should all see, to uh, Fantastic Fest. For those of you that do not know, Fantastic Fest is a genre film festival that takes place in Austin, Texas every September. But what's uh, it what's it referred to as? What? The, the largest genre film festival oh, the the, largest in the genre U.S. film festival in the United States of America. And that's only because Fantasia is in Montreal. Is, in yeah. is it Toronto, Montreal? It's in Canada. Uh, so I, I was going to guess Toronto, but I, I actually don't know if that's right or not. <laughs> I, I want to I want to say it's Montreal. Yeah, um, we go every year. This year will be my fourth or fifth year. I don't remember one of those. Um, yeah. We've historically covered it on the podcast when we came back. I always bring my recording equipment down there with the intent of recording. And then we never do because we never have time. Um, but that's because you go to sleep earlier than everyone else, Scott. Yeah. And I get to the early movies on time to, to let everybody know 
what I mean by Scott goes to sleep before everyone else is that Scott goes to sleep at 3 a.m. <laughs> yeah. and everyone else goes to sleep at 5 a.m. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you for giving me my credit. I'm not like passing out of eight or anything. Yeah. Um, all right. So the festival's happening at the end of September this year. I can't wait. And they've released the first wave of films, uh, which are like crazy and exciting. And I just wanted to talk about them real quick on here because I don't know. I just felt like doing it. That's my podcast and I can do it if I want. So let's start with the big one, Adrian. Oh, you mean uh, First Love uh, by Takashi Miike? No, no. Oh. I was talking about Jojo Rabbit by Taika Waititi. Well, I was I was more excited for, you know, the international flair, but that's OK. Oh, stop it. It's technically international. He's from New Zealand. Yes, but uh, Jojo Rabbit, they just released the very short minute long uh, trailer, I believe, like a week or two ago because it it opens at TIFF and then opens at uh, Fantastic Fest, like which is like a week later because TIFF, most people don't know this, is like it's very beginning of September. It ends on the 15th. I know that. And then Fantastic Fest starts on the 19th. Yeah, I've always wanted to go to TIFF, but There's no time. that would mean I can't go to Fantastic Fest, and I just can't do that. So, yeah, uh, Jojo Rabbit, it is the U.S. premiere, because mm-hmm. like you said, it is premiering in Canada. So, And he'll um, be there. That's what I'm most excited for. And he'll for. be there. Yeah, it's crazy. I think it's going to be the opening night film. I don't think they've said that for sure, but I think most people think that's what's happening. Mm-hmm. Um. What do you think of the trailer? I mean, it was a really, really short trailer. It's short. It It gets everything, you know set across it shows you um everybody who's in it or at least enough people to to whet your appetite um i thought it was interesting because it feels kind of like a wes anderson movie from from the way the trailer cuts it yeah i i can see that i can see that yeah with, with the with the song choice with the way everything's framed it's with very quirky exactly sam rockwell shooting the guns and everything um, but but then it has a different kind of acerbic wit once you have uh, Taika Waititi step out as Adolf Hitler, which, yes, if you don't know anything about Jojo Rabbit, it, of course, is the movie where Taika Waititi is an imaginary friend Adolf Hitler. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I didn't know Taika Waititi was Jewish, um, mm-hmm. which surprised me. But I, that, to me, makes it even better. I'm glad you did your homework. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, all right. What, what else? What else did big do you want to talk about? Uh, I mean, they, they've got they've got a whole bunch of fun stuff. I did mention uh, Takashi Miike because Takashi Miike is always, you know, um, worth checking out. Well, not always, Adrian. Yeah, I mean, he he is. I mean, OK, <laughs> he, I didn't I didn't like one one Miike movie and suddenly I'm the guy who hates him. According no, to our fantastic no, 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 I mean, one it's. Movie. It, the, the thing about Mike is Mike, of course, you know, famously just a couple of years ago hit upon his, you know, hundredth movie. Yeah. And, but and but he's changed as a filmmaker and you never know exactly what you're going to get because there's so many different shades of Mike. He might be adapting um, a play into a movie. He might be having a film be a uh, like a film version of the actual stage play that he put on at one point it could be uh, a film that's kind of like children of the lesser god that deals with you know industrialists who are getting ready to move into um and to tear down a forest area where there's a bunch of villagers it could be a movie about uh a a couple yakuza guys who are Mm -hmm. in love it could be a high-flying fantasy film you you never know but it's always going to be something interesting you might not like it but you know that you're going to get something different from what the last mike film is and i think that's very much why they're having it uh the other big thing that might not be big to everybody but it, it shows the various levels of fantastic fest is the amount of repertory showings that uh agfa is bringing and they of course announced them uh, ahead of time you know after a couple of years ago when people were uh, upset about what secret screenings were but i mean they're going to have a 2k restoration of the peanut butter solution they're <laughs> I can't believe they're doing this. they're going to have the fully uncut gore version 
of Tammy and the T-Rex, which I missed at Cinepocalypse, but I've heard wonderfully terrible and brilliant things about. Yeah. So, I mean, that's that that's so much fun. You've got just so many films that, that look interesting. Yeah, In the Tall Grass is premiering, um, yes. which is a Stephen King adaptation. Um, so, you know, I'm game. My love of Stephen King requires me to see all these films. Do you have, you have a, a video essay about uh, showgirls? Oh, I'm like ridiculously excited about that. Exactly. I, I, and there's the 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 follow up movie to um, the uh, 78 by 52, the psycho documentary. Yeah. Um, the same people that did that are making a alien documentary. And I'm really into that because I really enjoyed 78 by 52. Uh, I, I really like that movie a lot. So I'm excited about this alien documentary. Uh, there's just so many like that's what I love about Fantastic Fest is like. Like you have big things like Jojo Rabbit to get excited about. You have small things to get excited about. And then you have things that you're just going to find that you yeah. weren't even expecting. Well, like I'm, I'm really interested about this one. That's a, a, a USA Canadian uh, co-production in the shadow of the moon that it's got a very small um, synopsis, but it, it hooked me. It says in 1988, a Philadelphia police officer doggedly hunts a serial killer whose crimes seemingly follow no pattern, but he hasn't considered how far the repercussions of his hunt may go like that. That's all you need. Just that little snippet that you're like, okay, yeah, I'll check that out. I'll definitely take a chance on it. And that's, what's great about uh, fantastic fest is that you might uh, go see a movie and be like, Oh, this is, this is interesting. And, and not think anything of it. You see it and you're like, Oh my God, this is amazing. Or you take a chance and you're like, you know what? This event sounds fun. I want to do it. And then somebody comes up to you afterwards and like, dude, you have to see this movie. You, you have to see this movie. And there's always a couple uh, films that are, that are like that. Like they're, they're going to have the new Quentin uh, Dupex movie. I, I know I'm pronouncing his name um, incorrectly, but he's the guy who did rubber um, he's the guy who did keep an eye out last year, which mm-hmm. was like 67 minutes long, but absolutely great. He did wrong cops. Uh, but his movie, the plot of that one is when uh, George buys himself a deerskin jacket, uh, he he will find his life on a collision course with madness, crime and the desire to be the only man wearing an overgarment. Yeah, that, I mean, that looks <laughs> that's I'm, that, that, that's like and, and this is only the first wave. They, yeah. So they still they have the second wave that I'll mention, um, like what more events they're going to have and, and several different movies, because what you have to realize about the middle of the summer to the end of the summer is you have a whole bunch of either film festivals that are going on or ones that are just making their announcements. So Fantasia have been going on. I think it's not like. It either just ended or it's at the tail end right now. They just announced TIFF's lineup. Uh, they're going to be announcing, uh, I believe, I can't remember what's a, if it's a New York Film Festival or Tribeca. That's toward, that's after um, Fantastic Fest. Um, Fright Fest is about to happen. So there's going to be some announcements of films that are coming in and there um, that and the Fantastic Fest second or or third wave, yeah. Yeah. that th- there'll be films that come out that it turns out they skipped one of those events to be at Fantastic Fest. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So all this to be said, uh, if you have ever thought about going before, just do it. There's still it. badges for sale. Um, it's do the fifteenth. It. It's the fifteenth anniversary of the festival, so it's sure to be just a big year for the festival in general. It will um, be so much. You'll see us down there. We'll be there having a great time. It's a lot of fun. Um, strongly recommend the festival. Worth the money. Absolutely. Uh, it's it's so great. It's so great. Just just a week of watching five movies a day. That's wonderful. Dr- <laughs> drinking a lot and eating terrible food. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm already like I'm already work I'm prepping myself uh, health wise for that week right now. Inoculate yourself. Yes, absolutely. All right, guys, that is all the time we have for you this week. If you have any opinions on Once Upon a Time in Hollywood or Quentin Tarantino in general, we want to hear from you. So reach out via email at doofmedia at gmail.com or over on our Twitter account at doofmedia. We want to know what you guys thought about this movie. Um, we talked about some diff- some pretty strong opinions that people had that some we agreed with, some we agreed with less. Uh, what do you guys think? And if you're not already subscribed to this podcast, we encourage you to do so. So you make sure you never miss an episode. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play, and pretty much anywhere else podcasts can be found. 
And of course, you can find all of our new shows over at our website, doofmedia.com. I said new shows. I meant all of our shows. What I was trying to say is we have a new show that uh, started today. Um, We just partnered with a couple guys who are making a show called Do the Right Thing. That's uh, W-R-I-T-E. Um, it is a writing prompt podcast. Basically the, the idea is three random words are selected. You spend 30 minutes to write a short story about those three random words, and then you submit it and they, the, both the hosts write their own and then they read theirs and discuss what they learned about writing, what the, how, what the experience taught them. And then they go over some, uh, some audience submitted one. So it's a, it's a really fun idea. I like that show a lot and it is now part of the doof network. So listen to it, subscribe, head on over to doofmedia.com. All right, Adrian, thanks so much for hanging out, man. Thanks for coming. It was great talking with you. Absolutely. Um, all right. That is it for us. Adrian, where can people find you on the Internet if they want to hear your incredible thoughts? Oh, well, you know, I'm I'm here and there. I might be between things. But uh, I mean, if you want the simplest thing, just go on to Twitter and put in Yo Adrian Torres and you will find me. Um, my icon is very recognizable these Aww. days, sadly. Uh, because it is Redger Hauer with a pigeon on his head from Split Second. Um, before no one knew what it was. Now everybody knows what it is because he sadly passed away. But that, that that's where I am there. Um, if for some reason anyone who's listening to this happens to be in the Kansas City area, you can easily find me every single Tuesday at Alamo Draft House as I am the in-house host of Terror Tuesday. Well, there you go. Thanks, Adrian. And thanks again for hanging out. It's always great to talk to you. Um, And we will be back next week with a new episode. Matt will be back. And I think we have another patron produced episode where Adrian, they keep making me watch anime. And so I have to watch another anime next week. We're talking about Code Geass Lelouch of the Rebellion. (laughs) Hey, hey, Scott, can you what, what do they what do they keep doing to you? Keep making me watch the anime. Okay, see, if you keep saying it like that, they're going to keep making you watch it. So can we try Can we try it a little bit cheerier? What are they having you do next week, Scott? I I get to watch more anime, and you know how much I love anime. It's so good. Oh, there we go. It's so good. You slayed the beast. It's so good. It's just so, like, it's such quality entertainment. (laughs) I Really, there's nothing better. Hey, Scott, who's your favorite anime voice actor? Uh, We'll see you all next week. I have no fucking clue. My name is Doof, and you'll do what I say. My name is Doof, and you'll do what I say.